Okay, question for Ashley. What revolutionary food policy or policies are currently being developed here in Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Pork fatty. <laughs> <laughs> um, what policies are being executed here in Hawaii? Well, um, I do know I was in a meeting last week with um, state and city officials that are working on getting EBT transportation in our roving open city markets. Now, those open city markets do not have to source locally. A lot of them are large fruits and veggie distributors, but it, I think it's very easy for us to implement some sort of quota system that says we want the open markets to source locally and we want the EBT transfer stations to be there. They do currently accept SNAP benefits, but you have to sort of wait until after the rush and fill out these long forms and paperwork and um, uh, Apart from that being an issue of pride, it's also a lot of people don't have time to do that. So these transfer stations would act like a credit card transaction. Um, I do know that Kim Coffee Isaac and a hui of farmers um, is going to start working on drafting a different set of food safety legislation. And for any of you that were sort of tuned in to what happened this summer, we saw food safety legislation drafted in the interest of large retailers. Um, Large retailers want to source locally, but they're putting burdens on small farmers to see that food safety executed. The one thing that I think is really great about Kim's and these other farmers' efforts is that now the farmers are going to put their interests on the table, and we're going to see food safety legislation drafted a little differently. Are the other mics not working? OK, we'll, we'll work with this one. Lisa, what are some of the obstacles to getting EBT at farmers markets in the first place? I think the first thing is um, is the, just the manpower and the responsibilities that um, that the person responsible for doing the EBT in the farmers markets have to has to incur. Um, I don't think it's uh, we we explore the um, possibility of have, having it be a volunteer position because I think in other farmers markets across the nation is a volunteer position. But um, while we're um, taking a look at it, we realize that, uh, you know, I mean, in some ways, if we work it, if we work it really well, if we design it really well, why not create a job? You know, why not create jobs with this? Why not create businesses, you know, with this instead of um, tapping into our community all the time as um, volunteers, which is, volunteerism is great, but at a time, in our, in, our, in our economy, people need jobs. And, and creating green jobs like this, community service jobs like this, um, I think it's, I think that's a, that's a challenge and I think that's a win-win challenge. Um, so that's the number one um, challenge, I think, is the fan is the, is the is the power. This is not directed to any particular uh, panelists, but how do we get the big grocery stores, Safeway, Times, Foodland, etc., to buy more local produce and expand farming in Hawaii? I really believe that it's a question of, I mean, this idea that you can create demand and then and having the conversation stay there is a fallacy. I believe the issue is the supply side, because the powers that be, like the Darth Vader's, want us to stay in this, this demand question. But when you start talking about supply, you start talking about land, you start talking about water, you start talking about all the things, providing equitable jobs for farmers, and these types of structures that are not necessarily in their best interest. And I think <clears throat> these, we get them knocking on our doors. And it's not a question of, of supply. I mean, there's the, the food safety process, yes, that can be kind of addressed. But it really, 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 if you believe in this, you have to push at, you have to push at getting them to open up lands for farming and figuring out new structures, allowing farmers to own farm land, all these prohibitive costs. The supply is not a problem. And maybe just that one part of getting the food safety certification piece figured out might be something to look at. Anyone else want to comment on that one? Okay. Nope. Okay. Um, 
love the idea of countrifying the city, but please talk about examples of cities that have managed to start this where real estate is expensive as in Hawaii. I did some research for an article I wrote um, a couple years ago about rooftop farming, rooftop gardening. And this, uh, to me, is one of those issues that it's like, duh. We have a huge runoff problem in Honolulu. You can't swim or paddle in the Alawai without crossing your fingers and hoping that you don't get some sort of crazy bacteria that is coming from rainwater runoff. Rooftop gardening, we have, I think, something like uh, over 50,000 vacant square feet of rooftop just in central Honolulu alone, right? So if we could create concentrated agricultural operations like greenhouse farming, like you see in Milwaukee at Growing Power, and we have that on the top of our roofs, not only are we absorbing rainwater, keeping our oceans cleaner, we're also growing food, we're creating jobs, we're using land wisely. Um, and I think you see Chicago, Seattle, Portland, and New York are all leading the nation in creating re rooftop agricultural real estate. Um, this one is for Dexter. As a public school teacher at one of the largest Hawaii high schools, I wanted to know how to start growing and composting to support our cafeteria. I asked the DOE until I got the right person to answer, and the answers detailed all the obstacles that prevent change. Quite reasonable sounding. So what's next? How can public schools be leading versus making excuses? It's happening, so I guess there are ways to get over the, the obstacles. Um, we have, we have, actually we work with facilities a lot um, about these questions, because there's a great, great uh, handout that tells you that you can't plant citrus trees and you, but you can't plant Google on campus, so that, that, that's good. But um, it, it's it's really outdated. It's really outdated. Um, and you know, we have schools that are, have planted fruit orchards already. Um, there's actually Kalani High School is doing actually a pretty interesting um, pilot program about composting. We're working with a Wakashi vendor. I don't know if you can call them a vendor if they're taking stuff. But a Wakashi guy who's who's going to work on getting waste from a couple schools on the North Shore. To, to work on composting off-site. Um, and so the, all these things are kind of in the works. Um, and, and I would say hold tight, because in, it, it's starting to happen. And the best way to start it is if you can do it under the guise of, a, of education, of doing it as a class project. If it's student-led, um, it gets out of the hands of facilities and into the hands of curriculum. And if you can tie it to the benchmarks, everything's all good. So, so that that's the way to subvert the system, in my opinion. No, Randy Moore's not here, right? Randy, wave if you're here. <laughs> uh, no, really. If you can make it student-driven and a student-led activity, that's that's how you can get started now. Question for Ed: What's your dream for the food and beverage industry in ten years? This is greasy. Um, in 10 years, God, you heard it, I said it first on that video, I'm going to be farming in 10 years. Um, you know, I can't even answer that. I, I, come back to me, please. <laughs> okay, I got a bunch of questions here that kind of group around land use issues and development. So I think it's, it's fair to just ask the question of all the panelists if you can just go in order from Ashley on down this way for your perspective on land use policy. Is it aligned with what we're after in the local food movement we're talking about? And if not, how do we get it aligned? Is, is it currently aligned? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody in this room who's interested in food is happy with the way that we are dealing with our land. Um, the question that Brian Schatz asked about growing houses and growing farms goes to the core um, of the moral question this movement has to ask, not of ourselves, but of our policymakers. Um, that being said, I think that we can start using the land that is zoned to act smarter. We can start working on the prohibitive barriers that prevent farmers from farming the land. Um, we can start addressing questions of the average age of our farmer and the fact that we're not going to have farmers to farm the land that we currently have zoned unless we 
create well-paying farming jobs. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, the question of land use is is a part of a larger systematic question, but I think there are things we can do right now to use the land that we do have zoned ag better. I believe it provides awesome and wonderful space for entrepreneurialism when we get together behind innovative ideas and we constitute what we, we, we frame what constitutes highest and best use of land. Like we're trying to do, it's like we're doing five hundred thousand dollars, but we're also sending forty one kids to college and we're also rebranding the community. And you create all these secondary and tertiary effects around these things and you put the onus on them to explain and, and talk about in groups like this and People all put the onus on them to explain how does building Hokopini build new farmers? How does these things really allow us to feed ourselves? And you hold their feet to the fire because there's no longer an age where we can rely on emotional arguments to change things. We have to exhibit excellence in the work that we do and move forward with it. And I think that helps the policy shift. If we don't do that, then we're going to leave it up to them to figure it out. But we have the ability to change with what constitutes highest investments. I think the only thing to add is um, just coming from a school perspective, there's a ton of unused land there, and not that we're going to create slave labor through kids, although that's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. It's great. Um, great you got one person clapping. What, yeah, you know, <laughs> they must have kids then. Um, no, I, actually, um, but, but schools are a great way, and, and just and even that, if, if we can't get it, get schools to be allowed to to school gardens, again, just kind of the symptom of a larger issue, and definitely land use policy. You have to ask the do we have a land use policy in this state? Maybe that's kind of the issue. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is something I learned about a few months ago. Um, over in the Hamakuo Coast, there's all this land, right, that um, used to be our sugar plantation. Um, I heard about this project that um, somebody's working on, you know, a UH Hilo program where they're trying to, they have a, like a, it's like a farming and ag kind of, um, kind of like um, degree they're trying to um, develop there. And it's 18 months and um, you go in, you learn, um, there's farming, men, there's um, ag mentors, so it's all hands-on, or I think it's textbook first, and then it's hands-on, and then for a part of that, um, the Department of Ag, the Department of Ag I heard, um, what they do is they lease that land um, to these young student farmers um, to farm as part of the program. And I'm thinking that projects like that, where we're, it's kind of combining how do you how do you how do you build more farmers at the same time how do you keep land ag? You know, I think that's a very interesting way of looking at how do you secure that land. Um, that's, yeah, it's like that, you know? Totally. I'm still thinking about the, what my dream food and beverage industry is like in 10 years. Um, and I, I didn't hear a thing that you just before just said. Um, I, I, the food here is so good. I, I think Hawaii is the best food in the world. Um, and aside from everything that we're, we're saying here, the, 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 the the, the sense of family and the, and the, the pride and the ingrained aloha aina comes through in our food. So when I think of an improvement as a food and beverage industry as a whole, maybe, maybe a, a few people, I mean, the general comes up within it, but really, there's no place, whenever I go away and I eat, coming back here is um, a joy. I mean, we've got the best seafood, we've got the, I mean, it's, I, I can't, yeah, it's good. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, yeah, sorry. We'll finish with this question. I'd like to give each of you a chance to respond to this, and it really gets to the root of what uh, this particular conversation was about, which is there's a, a group of questions here about what can we do. So what can we do as the average person to support policy change, to support young farmers, to support more food in schools, to uh, support greater access to folks with low incomes to healthy fresh food and to help re revolutionize the food industry and the restaurant industry. Okay, Ed, you can kick us off. What, what, 
one thing that you ask people to do? The biggest way you can help the food and beverage industry <laughs> is plant a garden, cook at home, sit down and eat with, with a family with the TV off and your shirt on. My mom always told me that. <laughs> and to me, it's, it's there, there's that's really the best thing we can do. It's not for the food and beverage industry, it's for, for all of us. Just grow food, cook food, and eat food together as a family. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind is just, or the strongest thing that comes to my, my mind is what Ashley talked about. Um, there's a lot of regulations coming down the line. Um, when it comes in, Coming down the line, that's going to really affect our food system, here, our local food system. And um, in some ways, we all need to, we already, everyone here probably is, but I'm um, taking, taking a stand on it. But when I'm kind of feeling the, the, the move, that where this movement is going is towards this attitude, in some ways, um, of, of looking at our food system as a commons, you know, where we all, this is something we, our food system belongs to us. You know, we have the responsibility to protect it. Um, so I, there's, lot, there's legislation, we have, enough, we have some time to um, put together some legislation um, and to keep vigilant on, um, on the kind of regulations that are coming down nationally. Um, that's, the, that's the strongest thing that comes to my mind. I hit on legislation again, um, though I, I don't, I, I fear sometimes legislating a lot of action, but being involved in it is really important, and really now is the time to start talking. The, do you know your legislator for your district? Like, could you tell me their name? Um, I, I hope so. And if not, please find out, um, because that's that's an important start. Um, so, so get to know your legislator and, and be a keep abreast. Um, as Ashley stated, the food safety bill kind of really slipped through everybody um, uh, until really the last minute. And, and so if we have a 200 eyes on it, or 400 eyes, I guess that would be, um, it, it'd be, it, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot safer. Um, and then the other part is just like, be, be involved, get, if you can, with whatever level of commitment you can do, if it's really just clicking on an I will statement and following through on that, great. If it's I will commit to eating mobile one day, um, that, that's great because as, as much as we need work on the supply side, the it, it needs to start somewhere. And that's why Whole Foods really is, is great in, in that it has to start somewhere. Um, and But it can't end there. That we need to take it into communities um, that, that are higher need also um, as mobile mobile food stuff can, can go to. Um, and, and just to increase access that way. Volunteer for a farm to school program. Um, donate to, to things if, if, you're, if you'd rather put your money there. Um, but but be committed, make a commitment and, and follow through. Well, I would, that question would be answered differently um, in different places. And because I can look out the window and see Kahala and Hoikai, remember that purchasing is a political act. And that by purchasing from your small organic farmers, you make us community politicians because we hold weight. Money, if you look at our, our farms and programs like ours, all the programs are in um, the, the, the clip that was shown by Mark, and all of all of these different organizations that come. When you purchase from us, you turn money into mana. And we accrue mana through that, and we can sit at the table with them, not begging for a handout. And I look forward to the day where they have to hold 24 hour vigils to have a few, uh, land turned into a housing on Paramount Island. I look forward to that day. I'll, I'll go on and on and I'll go on my heart and do my shuffle. Because that's what we have to do. But the movement has shifted, and really, money is politics and power. And when you purchase politically, you empower communities in ways that are almost unimaginable. So, I'm not. I think this is a hard question for me because I actually, at least in this sort of anti-climate change or movement, I always get really frustrated when people are like, 
you change your light bulbs, and that's you did your your work. I, I feel like we have to hold ourselves to a higher measure of accountability in this movement. Um, and but I, I, I'm a small business owner, and I look at my team of women that I work with, and I see that they're all really good at certain things. And I think that we all have gifts and talents that we can contribute to the strength of this movement. And if your strength is not going down and testifying at the legislature, if your talent is not writing and drafting bills or being a part of that political process, if your talent is owning a social enterprise like town, you have to see yourself as contributing to that movement and being willing to lend the power of your name and your business to political projects. You have to be willing to be unpopular. You have to be willing to make moral stands as business owners. You have to be willing to step out and say, I'm going to make these choices against the bottom line because it's better for my community, and I believe that my community will learn more by doing that. You have to make a stand in your classroom. If you're a teacher, if you're a student, you have to stand up against some of these huge forces. My university, UH uh, Manoa, just accepted a $500,000 grant from Monsanto, and I think I'm one of the only professors at Hawaii who brought that up in my class and said, is that something you're happy about? Is that something that you want to see happen at your institution? If not, stand up, do something, right? And we all just have to think, what tool am I in the broad toolkit? How do I want to wield my personal power? And you have to understand yourself as a part of the collective. You're not operating alone. We are here together. And I think if we pool our resources, if we understand this movement also as a cultural commons, we can do more together, uh, together as a collective than we could ever do alone um, with our pocketbooks. And, and, I, and I think that we can, and I think that we will. I'm sorry, we're going to have to end it there. Can you help me thank So as I said, uh, our commitment, uh, both the Hawaii Food Policy Council and Kona Hawaii, is that there's a, a many questions here that were left unanswered. And two things that we will do, one is we will publish all those questions in one place, maybe two places, both the Hawaii Food Policy Council site and the Kanu site, and invite not only our panelists, but also folks in the audience to begin a discussion about those questions. And the second thing is that both the Food Policy Council and Kanu are committed to continuing this conversation through forums like these and other avenues, and we'll use these questions to identify the topics for those forums. I mean, some of the things that were raised here are tough questions about land and water, about GMOs, about the tough issues of running a social enterprise that does produce profit but also stays very community-minded. I think those are just some of the things that, we, that we'll need to tackle in future forums like this. Um, Two things I'd like to close with. The first is a mahalos to the second half of the list of folks that helped make this happen that I didn't get to thank, specifically at the beginning. Again, Kyle Shimoda and Chef Hawaii. <laughs> Kasha Ho, Kano Hawaii's community organizer and Kano Hawaii volunteers who all bring this together. Amanda Corby and her crew from Under My Umbrella. <laughs> Ashley Chung, who also played a key role in helping bring the logistics of this event together. Yeah. And I know I'm missing a bunch of folks, um, but thank you. We're grateful for the venue, all the time, energy, and effort that went into making this possible. Um, final closing comment, and that is, on your seats when you came in were two cards. One was a blank index card for your questions. The other is a card that on one side has evaluation questions, and on the other side has five commitments to choose from. The theme of tonight was access, but the thread that tied it all together was action. And the question we finished with was, what can I do, what can the ordinary person do, what can a person who is involved in the food movement do to push this work forward? There's five options there. You can write in your own if you don't. What I ask of you tonight is that you fill out that form, front and back, both evaluation and one commitment if you feel moved to make it, and drop it in the drop box on the way out. If you complete that form and drop it off, we have a gift for you on the way out. It's a seed packet, local seeds, 
that were put together by students at the Luke Center for Public Service for us. So drop your car in the drop box, take a seat back on the way out, and please drive and travel safely on the way home. Thank you.